This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 474. This is your spoiler-free place for Star Wars community and conversation. I'm your host, Dan Z. Thrilled to be talking Star Wars with each and every one of you, and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you for taking a moment to put aside the turkey, or maybe you're enjoying the show while you're eating turkey and pumpkin pie and all that great stuff, and I don't blame you. I am so thankful for each and every one of you. That is the topic of this week's Coffee with Kenobi, the top five things we are thankful for in the world of Star Wars. Joining me is the amazing Steve Sansweet. Who better to talk about what we are thankful for in Star Wars and the guy who's brought so many memories to so many of us. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. Joining us today for a cup of coffee is returning guest to the show. He is probably one of the most, certainly one of the most requested, one of the most frequent guests on Coffee with Kenobi, all the way back to when I actually sent you Starbucks. Of course, we're talking <laughs> about the one and only Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan. Steve, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Dan. It's great to be back, and it's great to say hello to your vast audience out there in the galaxy. Yes, yes. Well, we're always happy to chat with you. You have been very, very busy. Everywhere I look, you're popping up. You're the Rancho Obi Wan social media is fantastic, and there was a lot of great stuff that you're able to show for the virtual Rancho Obi Wan gala. Please uh, let us know about that before we even get started, because there's a lot of cool stuff there. Well, for the gala this year, we we've had a virtual gala for two years in a row because of the pandemic, and um, we've extended what is our virtual online museum. So it was a mere ten dollars to sign up for the gala if you weren't already a member a ten dollar a month member of the virtual museum and until november 29th we have all of the content from the virtual gala on our site ranchoobiwan.org in the virtual museum section so i uh, invite fans to tune in and take a look and we uh we, we sent three wonderful ladies up to the loft, which we haven't uh, disturbed for about 10 years. And they found all sorts of treasures, including a Star Wars 24 sheet billboard that I didn't know that I had. I mean, the problem with having 300, 400,000 pieces in your collection is that sometimes you forget. Now, how I could forget that is totally beyond comprehension because I have been pining away and telling the story about how I passed up buying one years and years ago because there was some white paper torn on, on one of the sheets and I regretted that not doing it because it could have been fixed and it was only a thousand dollars back then and it was a billboard and they're very rare and blah 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 and here I had one, and I don't know how long I've had it, although Ann Newman thinks that it's been there for probably 10 years at least because of the distance in the pile that it was beneath. So we measure things archaeologically here. If it's yes. two inches down, it, it was under episode one material, so she assumes that I got it before 1999. <laughs> How perfect that it's archaeological, right? Because of I've always actually wanted to ask you about that. Do you do you have a number of Indiana Jones items? I I used to collect Indiana Jones too in a modest way, but just about the only thing I have now is a Lego set because it has the brick with R two D two and C three PO from the uh, the Well of Souls. The sure Well of is that right? Did I say? Yeah, that? that's right. That's yeah, absolutely okay. right. Yes. And I remember you telling me one of the first times we had you on uh, that you also had quite an ET collection as well. I had a huge ET collection. In fact, I think it was the only ET collection in the world. Nobody else collects ET, <laughs> as I found out when we were selling things off. And I have flipped a lot of things. I, I started collecting space toys, Japanese robots, and 
the newer space toys and Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and all of that stuff. Well, I loved E.T. and I started collecting E.T. too. Star Wars just sort of overwhelmed it all. And at some point, at various points along the way, I've sold off the space toy collection and the E.T. collection, which was, I think there's still some pieces that haven't sold. But uh, yeah, I love science fiction and fantasy movies. Oh, it's given us so much entertainment which I think because tonight we're going to talk about the top five things we are thankful for in Star Wars. This show, of course, is going to, if you're listening now, then it is Thanksgiving. So have a very happy, healthy, and safe Thanksgiving to all of you. And really, we're here with Steve, which is the gift that keeps on giving in the world of Star Wars. So this is this is going to be a lot of fun. So you are my guest, Weiss. I would love for you to go first. Uh, what is uh, number five you have on your list? Number five is sort of related to Star Wars, but not specifically Star Wars. My job at the Wall Street Journal, where I was a reporter, a deputy bureau chief, and then bureau chief for 26 years, the last nine of which I was bureau chief in Los Angeles. Um, what that meant was I was invited to the all-media screening for a little movie named Star Wars, on the back lot of 20th Century Fox at the Darrell F. Zanuck Theater, two Saturdays before, on the 14th of May, 1977, and Star Wars opened, at least in 32 theaters, on May 25th. Uh, but I was there in the audience and hadn't read any reviews, hadn't had the movie spoiled for me, just the way I approached E.T. on the first screening. and. It was just a marvelous experience. And I, just like so many others of us who saw Star Wars on the big screen, uh, the experience of sitting in an audience of journalists and looking overhead as the Star Destroyer came through, saying, where the hell is that coming from? Um, and just sort of giggling to ourselves because, of course, we had been taken in by the mastery of George Lucas's magic. Um, and uh, that was an experience I will never forget. And after the screening was over, I went up to um, the vice president of publicity who was in charge of inviting the journalists in the audience and said, could I get my screening ticket back? And that was one of my initial collectibles. Not the first, oh. but one of the initial ones. Do you still know where that is? No. <laughs> it's, <laughs> we, we have a huge ephemera collection, and we've started sorting through it, and we have all kinds of file cabinets, and so it's just a matter of going through 100 boxes and cataloging everything, and uh, we've started that process, and we will find it. Marvelous. Uh, Concetta, we're looking at you. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> number two, number two in my Wall Street Journal experience with Star Wars was my first interview with George Lucas in 1987 because I wanted to do I, I convinced the journal to do an op edit piece on Star Wars, the 10th anniversary, the first 10 years of Star Wars. And who better to do that but a, a true fan and journalist, of course. And. This was one of the ways I was going to get up to Skywalker Ranch and visit the Holy Mecca. But I was told, George would be happy to do it on the phone. And I said, yeah, but I'd be happy to come up there. I'd be happy to fly up. It's just, you know, an hour trip. And the... George would be happy to do it on the phone. Okay. So I didn't make it up to Skywalker <laughs> Ranch that time, but I had a wonderful half hour interview with George and wrote an, uh, uh, a piece for the uh, op edit page of the Wall Street Journal on the 10th anniversary of Star Wars and what it meant. The third thing, my the skills that I developed at the journal and the confidence that I had to cold call the new head of publishing at Lucasfilm in 1990 when I heard that they were going to publish a book or were looking or considering a book, uh, a price guide, the first official Star Wars memorabilia price guide, and cold called and said, if anybody writes that book, it should be me. And the response was, and you are who? 
And <laughs> then I can say, well, I'm a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. I did this interview with George three years ago, blah, 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 blah. And that was the beginning of a real relationship with Lucasfilm that, uh, that lasts to this day. Mm. And now I Beautiful. will take a breath and let you speak. <laughs> <laughs> I could just listen to you talk all the time, which is one of the reasons why it's fun to to do the the virtual Rancho Obi Wan Gala tours, which I love so much. So my number five uh, is I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but the first time I saw Star Wars was in nineteen seventy eight. In seventy seven, every time I went, it was sold out. I never got a chance to see it. We tried five, six, seven, eight times. It was so discouraging. And then one fateful day, we pull into this onto this gravel road, and my dad rolls down the window and he says, Four for Star Wars. And so the first time I saw it was at a drive in movie theater oh, in New wow. Orleans, Louisiana in 1978. Wow. Holy cow, a drive in! My goodness, what an experience! Yes. It really was. And you know, you, you t- we talk about the Star Destroyer, of course, it's so iconic, but two things stood out to me. In that viewing, I mean, there are a lot of things stand out to you because here we are still talking about it over 40 years later. But the Millennium Falcon and lightsabers in a, in, a, in a mythology full of iconography that is just spellboundingly cool. The Millennium Falcon and lightsabers have been the two things that I've been the most thankful for because I just, you know, with my with my children, uh, stuff at Galaxy's Edge, of course, the countless movies and video games and animated stuff, and then. The, the Dark Saber and the Mandalorian. These are the things that have just taken my imagination and sent it everywhere possible. You know, like you, I'm, I'm sure uh, if we were to go through and look at every single piece in your museum, which would take a very, very blessedly long time, it would be <laughs> heavenly. But surely the Millennium Falcon would be one of the most frequently seen pieces. Just the image of it alone just captures the imagination, even if you're not a Star Wars fan. I feel like people know what the Millennium Falcon is, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, no, that was great. There are many Millennium Falcons at Rancho Obi-Wan. Edible ones and not, and otherwise. I thought of you when I got this. Did you get this yet? No, I was very jealous when I saw the photo uh, that you posted, the goldfish. So that's going to be available yes. in January, huh? January, that is correct. Yes, you you will love them, of course, because I know yeah. you've got an amazing collection of edible Star Wars items. Yeah, including forty year old Pepperidge Farm cookies. Ooh, and the C three PO cereal, I'm sure. Yeah, we've eaten all that, but there's still some <laughs> cookies around. Great. Well, uh, what's what's your number four? Number four is the Star Wars merchandise, the original Star Wars Kenner action figures, which really rekindled the collecting bug in me. I had started collecting space toys again months before Star Wars came out. And, um, but this was really special. There was something about the action figures. I opened all 12 of my first action figures in 1978, put them on the shelf, put clay under the feet to make them stand up and uh, still kept the cards and try to get the bubbles off as, as, as well as I could, because I was even back then when I was buying space toys, I was taking pictures of everything, but trying to keep the packaging intact. Um, eventually, of course, I decided I needed to replace as minty um, figures on cards as I could find and um, went to a dealer about 40 miles from my home in Los Angeles and he put together a set of the 12 figures for me and um, I think there was something like $145 for all 12 figures men on the card um, only we had a time machine these days to go back and oh. relive that. Then he took out another figure that he had below the, the counter and said, are you interested in this? And it was a Jawa, but I had never seen this one before because it had a vinyl cape on it. And it was on an oh. unpunched card. 
And I said, Ooh. well, that's ugly. Why would they do something like that? I said, did some fan make that? And he said, no, no, this was an, we understand it was an early production item. And then they decided to go with the cloth cape. I said, well, how much do you want for it? And he said, well, I need to get 45 bucks for it. And I said, 45, I just paid you 145 for 12 figures and you want 45 for that. I'll pass. And so I only had a couple of bucks left on me. He only took cash and I needed gas. And I didn't know how, how much gas I had in the tank. So I went outside, put the key in the lock of the car and said, well, and walked back in and gave him 45 bucks in cash and then crossed my fingers that I'd make it home on the quarter of a tank of gas that I had. <laughs> <laughs> what a great story. So you never know. But those action figures really hooked me, and that led to the play sets and the, uh, the vehicles and, you know, all, all the wonderful stuff. And then it got well beyond that. Oh, boy. One of my favorite things is when you walk down the stairs of Rancho and you've got that big, beautiful display of all the Kenner Star Wars action figures and that incredible... Did you get that from Target? Does that sound right? Target hired a company yeah. to, that, that builds sets and displays. Yeah. And we did a, uh, a show for them at LA Live the weekend that, um, that uh, the weekend before The Force Awakens premiered. And, mm -hmm. um, and we were in a little uh, Quonset hut and we had some great displays. We brought down all the figures and and then they gave us all the displays, which we still have here and still use. And that was pretty spectacular. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a magical piece. It's you could I could spend hours just looking at that. And I remember you had given me the advice, you know, because I still have some of my old ones with the Toys R Us price tags. And you said, don't peel them off. And that was great advice, because before I talked to you, I did try to peel one of them off. And I see it every day. And I think I wish I would have talked to Steve. <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's great. Well, my number four is, you know, there are a lot of moments in memories, and we talked a lot about these last week. Um, Top Five Way Star Wars uh, makes us think about family, but for what I'm thankful for, I'm really thankful for Galaxy's Edge. Hmm. Galaxy's Edge is, I mean, I love Walt Disney World. I mean, I, I worked there in college. I proposed to my wife there. We had our honeymoon. We've taken the boys several times. But when I heard that Disney purchase Lucasfilm. I was so overcome with emotion knowing we're going to get an episode seven, eight and nine. I remember you talking to Jason and Jimmy on their show. Uh, I believe you were driving to a meeting and I remember you talking about it and just the, I could hear the excitement and the, and the focus in your voice. And it was just all so magical. But then one day uh, they announced that they were going to open a star Wars land basically on both coasts. And I actually cried. I cried because I thought, Everything has come together now for me. This wonderful place that is that brought me out of my shell. I've said many times, before I was a teacher, I was a very shy, quiet, insecure young man. And then I worked at Disney, and it brought me out of my shell, and it just focused me in such a different way. I think, and you know this, uh, as well as anybody, when you find your path, doors open up for you, and things happen. And boy, did things ever happen. And I go to Galaxy's Edge. I went to the media preview. And getting to see the Millennium Falcon, the only one one scale Millennium Falcon ever built for both coasts, uh, you feel like a kid again. When you see it, you feel like a kid again. And then I got to bring my wife and my little guy, Mason, to it. And he was just amazed. Seeing it through the eyes of someone you love is very, very special. And one of my favorite stories about Galaxy's Edge is that we spent the whole day there. And then I said to Deanna, you know what? And I, every Saturday we have something called Dadder Day where he and I hang out together and we just do something. And I said, we think we're going to have Dadder Day tomorrow at Batuu at Galaxy's Edge. Would you like to come with us? And she goes, I think I've seen enough brown rocks for one day. Is what her <laughs> response was. So she went shopping at Disney Springs and we spent the whole day again at Galaxy's Edge. He built a lightsaber 
at Savvy's workshop, which to me is the most magical thing there in a land full of magical opportunities, moments, and merchandise. Like, you know, you, you got when we go there, we got to get out of there. The merchandise is incredible because so much of it is in fantasy. And I love that mm -hmm. that whole idea and that whole concept of what they've come up with. Magnificent. And those and those those legacy lightsabers are just there's something else. They are they are really, really special. Did when you when you look at a legacy lightsaber, it, I'm sure I mean, how does it compare to a Mastic replica lightsaber? Well, I've never actually had one in my hands, Dan. Really? Yes. That's that's that is wild to me. I have a Savvy's one that I built, which I love. Oh, perfect! It's pretty much the same exact thing, Not really. But the way I haven't got I haven't gotten back to Batu since the media, uh, the initial media day out here in uh, Anaheim. Yes. So okay, well, I'm anxious to do that. Well, hopefully for celebration uh, for Star Wars After Dark or even some other time, they'll be able to. You would think if Steve Sansweet is on bat too, this that is a royal situation. We got to get you back in there. I look forward to it. Oh, that'll be great. So, yeah, that is that is my number four, Galaxy's Edge and everything that encompasses that. So we are back to you for number three. Number three is the um, the early shows, the Comic-Cons, the... Star Trek shows, the science fiction conventions, and the dealers that I met and who befriended me and who I became great friends with. Um, there was this, uh, there were these ladies, Ann and Judy, who were science fiction dealers. And um, they, I helped them, they helped me. I used to do a toy show in Glendale, California that I had a lot of wind-up toys, battery-operated toys, some of the robots, but a lot of other battery-operated toys and older things for sale. And Ann and Judy wanted to sell Star Wars stuff at this show. And I got a call from the, the lady who ran the show and said, I'm a little reluctant to give them a booth because I think, you know, that's new stuff that you can just buy at the store. And I said, no. This stuff is highly collectible. This is in the early 80s. And I said, I think you would not go wrong by nobody would be. You wouldn't be embarrassed by having a Star, a Star Wars dealer at the show. Imagine the time when you would have to talk up having a Star Wars dealer at a show, at a toy show. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the shows that Michael Jackson used to come to in disguise as a... Um, as a uh, doctor or as a clown, passed by the booth a couple of times. So he just oh. called it, of course, by dressing up like that, he just called attention to himself. But Ann and Judy also got me into a show. Um, I think it was the 10th anniversary of Star Wars. There was a show in San Jose, California that I flew up for because they were going to have a lot of dealers. And they got me in an hour early. And there was something that I spied from the door. And I immediately went over to this. There was a chair. And I said to the dealers, what's that? And they said, well, some guy who worked at ILM brought it to us. And we think it's a Boba Fett backpack. And in fact, it turned out to be a Boba Fett stunt backpack. And um, I said, uh, how much? And they said, oh, we're going to just sort of leave it there and see what it attracts during the show. And uh, uh, I said, I, I just kept bugging them. Of course, I had flown up and I had flown up for the day. And so uh, even if I was able to convince them, I didn't have any way of getting it back. So I went over to Ann and Judy and said, if I can manage to get this prize, would you be willing to take it back to where you live and then I will come over at some point and pick it up in Southern California? And they said yes. And so I went back and I bugged them so much that about five minutes before the show opened, they agreed to sell it to me for, the, for an incredibly reasonable price given what it was and what it was to become. 
Uh, and it was indeed one of the stunt backpacks used in the desert outside Yuma, Arizona in filming the Sarlacc scene. And um, so I thank Ann and Judy for that. Uh, another guy named Mike Stannard, who came over from the UK and introduced me to foreign toys and um, where I got my pallet toy vehicles and uh, play sets. Mm. I met a guy named Jim Stevenson who advertised in Toy Shop, which was a biweekly tabloid newspaper filled with ads before the internet, before eBay. And he called himself Mr. Star Wars, and he truly was. Really nice guy who's passed on, unfortunately. But um, we did a lot of trading and a lot of talking and a lot of deals. And a guy in Los Angeles named Harry Frydenberg, um, who was a poster dealer and um, also a bit of a bootlegger. He was responsible for bootlegging the famous triple bill poster. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. he made a mistake when he was doing it. And the triple bill poster is actually, there are 18 of them and from nine different theaters in North America, and they are photographic. And he printed his, of course, and so the black ink rubs off because there's so much of it. And he used a newspaper ad as the basis for his poster. And the newspaper ad had two lines of type, whereas the poster has three lines of type. So it's everybody knows it's a bootleg. But Harry enabled me to buy. I did a deal with Harry and his sons to buy a huge chunk of poster from the guy who was the... Um, at that point, the world's largest Star Wars collector, a guy named Walter Steuben in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hmm. And um, we bought hundreds and hundreds of posters, and I got first choice. But by doing that, it enabled me to um, pick and choose just the posters that I needed. But it was the basis of my poster collection, which now is about 3,000 Star Wars posters. And art prints and great stuff. So a lot of fond memories, a lot of wonderful people who helped me out in the early days of collecting. Isn't that magical? Boy, that is, that is just so, it's so gratifying, isn't it? Because a lot of these things that we're talking about, there, there are, there are moments, there are memories, there are things we're grateful for and that we're thankful for, but it always brings wonderful people into our lives. Yes, they become absolutely. like their friends and family. That actually brings me to the number three thing I'm most thankful for in Star Wars, and it is you, my friend, oh, Steve my Sansweet in Rancho Obi Wan. Yes, absolutely. So you don't know this, but you know, of course, as a as a Star Wars fan, especially you know in the '90s and with the Phantom Menace and all those things that were happening and then your role with Lucasfilm, so many collectors, countless, countless collectors. And I'm not just saying that uh, because you're on the show now. It, it's true. Uh, you have always been sort of the gold standard, be, not only because of your amazing collection and your vast knowledge and expertise, but you've always been so accepting and so gracious. You, you're a man of intelligence and clout and you've never let that, become a barrier. You've always embraced so many fans th throughout the world. And that is just, that's really special. And that's really, really rare. And then the first time I had you on the show, uh, Corey and I were so excited and, and dare I say a little nervous because this is Steve Sansweet that's going to be on coffee with Kenobi. And then we of course met at celebration and, and a lot of the galas and we've seen each other at, at some of the premieres. And then years ago at one of the galas, uh, the auction was about to start. And you and I hadn't gotten a chance to talk yet because the gal is very, very busy. There's a lot of people going on. A lot of people want to see you and talk to you. And you saw me and we kind of uh, jogged across the room and you gave me a big hug. And that meant so much to me. I'm kind of getting choked up thinking about it. Because just, it's sort of like Steve Sansweet is here. He's He's kind, he's loving, he's accepting. And I just felt like, I was a bigger part of the community because I know you well enough that I got to give you a hug. And that meant so much to me. It's just, it's, you are just a great guy. And I know you're not someone who likes a lot of attention necessarily, but 
You deserve it, my friend. I am definitely thankful for you and your friendship. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, I really appreciate that a lot. I mean, it's, it, it goes both ways, obviously. And that sort of crosses over to my number two, which was my job at Lucasfilm, which sort of happened on a fluke. Um, it was time to do something else at the Wall Street Journal. I didn't want to go back to New York headquarters. I didn't want to run a Southern California business edition of the journal. I didn't want to become a super reporter. And I got this strange call from Lynn Hale, vice president, now vice president of publicity, about to retire at Lucasfilm, asking me if I knew of anybody who would want a one year only, definitely one year only job reporting to Lucasfilm and going out and talking about the special editions to fans across the US. And I said, hmm, sounds interesting. Let's talk. And that led to 15, <laughs> 15 wonderful years at Lucasfilm, um, working with a great team, working at all three locations, Skywalker Ranch for several years, Big Rock Ranch, and then the Presidio. Um, it was uh, a thrill to meet and work with George Lucas. And uh, I mean, I didn't have that many meetings with George, but a couple times a year we would be involved in projects together. Um, the fan film awards was always a highlight on my schedule because George picked the George Lucas awards winner, the top prize in the fan films uh, along with the audience choice award. And I would, I would go there and would record George announcing the winner of the uh, prize sometimes on cue cards, sometimes on a little note opening in an envelope. Um, but it was, uh, it was uh, great. And uh, it got me to tour the world, um, meeting thousands of fellow fans and uh, becoming friends with uh, hundreds of fans uh, uh, and friends to this day. Um, it's been remarkable helping the 501st Legion get established and um, getting their relationship approved with Lucasfilm. Um, although there were some people at the company back in the early days who worried about people in Darth Vader masks robbing banks. Um, and I said, you know, they're going to do that anyway if we're making Darth Vader masks. So um, uh, just really fond memories of uh of spreading the gospel of lucasfilm and uh star wars and uh, uh being able to visit uh the filming sets of all three prequel movies with uh editors of the fan club magazines from around the world um seeing george in action on the set for a couple of hours um meeting some of the actors uh, meeting many of the actors from the original trilogy and then meeting the actors from the prequels, uh, both on the set and at shows. It was, I followed my bliss, as Joseph Campbell said, and uh, it led me to some truly amazing places. Let's take a quick break and we will return with more from Steve Sanswood, including a great story about the reveal of the title of Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. And didn't you, I believe, was it for Revenge of the Sith where you got to reveal the logo? Like in that the was, Superman fashion? That was the best. Yeah, that was absolutely yeah. the best the most exciting experience um, when my boss, Jim Ward, who was uh, vice president of marketing at Lucasfilm told me that he was going to let me reveal the title of the film. People who aren't Star Wars fans don't realize how the title of the films is such an important part of Star Wars fandom, the reveal of the title. It says so much or it mystifies or it, it just raises all kinds of questions. Um, 
and um, I, I knew we had a great title for episode three, and so I decided that we would do a, a fun thing on the fans, and we would uh, do a reveal of film. And so we had a wonderful editor at Lucas Video Productions who cut together this uh, three, four minute um, video where we showed action from each of the movies. And then we had episode four and then the Star Wars, you know, after some action from the movie, the the title of the film rolled up five, six, one, two. And then we had some behind the scenes action from uh, episode three. I think it was Ewan and uh, Hayden fighting and then uh, rolled up on episode three. And then instead of the title coming up, we stopped the film and then rolled back and people went, oh, and then rolled forward again and then revenge of the sith and people screamed and shouted and i walked in front of the podium there and i was wearing uh, an overshirt and took off the overshirt opened the overshirt and there i had the t-shirt with the old style revenge of the sith logo on it and i said and by the way the starwars.com booth on the floor of the convention center is selling these shirts as of now. And people stampeded out of the room. And the Comic-Con people told me afterwards, we wish you would have said something. We almost had an, an incident. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was great. It was absolutely uh, a, an amazing experience. That is great. I, and there's, there are still, there are stills of that, of you with that, with your shirt open with the logo yeah. and, who better to, to do that than you? That's great. And then, of course, leading to merchandise. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Of course. It ties it all together, doesn't it? It really does. So uh, we keep doing this, but your yours leads number two leads to my number two. I have two words for this. I have community and I have celebration. The two often intertwine, really, when it comes to Star Wars, because I still very much believe that we have a, a welcoming, vibrant, uh, amazing community. And there's nowhere is that more on display than a celebration. The very first time that Lucasfilm had a celebration podcast stage, we were picked to be the first show to go on there. And it was amazing because we had just seen the trailer, the first trailer for The Force Awakens, Chewie, We're Home. Everyone went ballistic. Right. Everyone went crazy and we're running over to try to get everything set up. And, and Corey and I are talking, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And we got to focus. We got to do this. We walk in there and I look up and the place is packed. Everybody wants to talk about the trailer. I see Leland Chi in the audience. And I felt like, my goodness, what's going on here? This is really, what a wonderful, rewarding thing. I was so thankful, so grateful, and so blessed seeing this wonderful community. Everybody was so supportive. And we weren't the only show in town. Of course, there, there are lots and lots of Star Wars podcasts. More and more pop up every single day. But in my experience, I have found everyone to be very welcoming, very gracious, and very willing to boost everybody up. So we, there's, Star Wars is a big, big pie. And there's lots and lots and lots of slices. And, and if you're the small amount of people that uh, aren't necessarily on the same wavelength, that's why God invented the mute button. And then yeah. you just don't have to about it. It's very simple. Very simple. Very simple, Dan. So that, yeah. And it just, it's always been so much fun. You know, again, you, you know, the community met so many wonderful people, been so many wonderful places. And it's, it's, I'm very, there's not a day that goes by since I've been doing the show for eight and a half years that I'm not appreciative, thankful, and grateful for the good fortune I've had because of hard work, because of perseverance, and because of this wonderful, amazing stars community. And I know next year when celebration happens again, I think those hugs are going to be just a little, just one or two seconds longer. The smile is going to be just a little bit bigger. The last is going to be a little bit more soulful because we've waited so long to get back together. And boy, is it going to be special. 
and talk about special my memories of celebration one and working with dan madsen the incredible mm -hmm. dan madsen um yes. and coming up with the idea of celebration and being able to put it together despite all the trauma and problems that we had the 50-year rains in denver and wondering whether we would ever do anything like this again and here we are going to i think what will be the 14th celebration including the international yeah. ones um yeah. it was uh, pretty amazing Number one on my list to be thankful for yes. is the establishing of Rancho Obi-Wan and the huge help of my compatriot in crime, Ann Newman, um, who we have uh, recently appointed as president and chief executive officer of Rancho Obi-Wan as I become executive chairman and founder of Rancho Obi-Wan. And with Ann's help and Consetta Parker, um, uh, we came up with the idea of turning the warehouse, it was a little more than a warehouse, but it, turning it into a nonprofit museum. And Anne has done so much work. Um, from the time that uh, I was having dinner at the Spaghetti Factory in San Diego during Comic-Con with a bunch of people from Rebel Scum and other friends, and I said, um, well, I really need somebody to help organize and inventory the collection. And Anne raised her hand and said, I'll do it. And uh, Anne came up for a visit for two weeks. We got along famously and the rest is history. And uh, sharing the collection with thousands of fans worldwide, we've had visitors from all over the world. That's what it's all about. It's the stories that we tell, the wonderful docents and volunteers that help us. Um, the people who contribute to it both monetarily and in items we just got a new full-sized r2 x2 a droid that appeared in star wars built by uh, someone in the midwest who wants to remain anonymous but gifted us this and um something i've always wanted for the museum to be able to especially for the kids who come and visit um it's just been an amazing journey for the last 10 years. This is our 10th anniversary and we're strategizing how to continue and, and, and grow. It, it is a, a must see. It is a, is a must destination. If you are a star Wars fan, it's, it's a must. It's just, there's the, I've been there four times and every time I go, I feel like it's the very first time. Because there's so many amazing things to look at. And St Star Wars is so good about the nostalgia aspect. Anyway, while continuing to perpetuate the future of the franchise as well. And I feel like Rancho Obi-Wan puts that on display like nothing else. Well, thank you, Dan. We try. And you will be uh, astonished and pleased and a bit befuddled when you visit the next time because we have changed everything around. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we, we've used the time to, uh, to go through the museum and, and move things and make things more accessible and more viewable and change displays. So uh, every time you come here, it looks like a, a new place. Oh, I can't wait. I cannot wait. Well, yours ties into my number one. And I just put one word. I put mythology. Mythology means story. It's the, the Greek word for story. And Star Wars is the great American mythology. We, people who know Star Wars know the history. George creating kind of a, a, his own mythology. He wanted to work with the Flash Gordon franchise. And the director fees were absurd. Um, and the way that laid out, he wasn't going to make any money off of it, really. And he, it was not even going to have him any control. So it, that that fell through, and thank goodness it did, because then he created his own mythology, which became a masterpiece, has inspired countless generations. And, you know, this isn't hyperbole; this is real. He has inspired so many different things. Uh, as an educator, you know, for years I, I, I worked in insurance, and I just didn't feel fulfilled. I just felt like something was missing in my life. And I spent so much time thinking about why I shouldn't be a teacher. I kept talking myself out of it. It was my refusal to call. You mentioned Joseph Campbell earlier. 
And I, I kept refusing. And then one day I just decided I need to do this. I've got to work with kids. I want to be a positive role model. I want to teach kids how to think, how to build their self-confidence, how to reach their own potential. The first lesson I ever taught was Star Wars and Shakespeare. First one I ever taught. And I thought, this is great. I can combine my two loves. And I certainly did. That led to so many wonderful things. Countless students I got to introduce the Star Wars franchise to. I got to be in a Target commercial in 2016 because I teach with Star Wars. Uh, at that point, I was using it with Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet, of all things. I just appreciate the art of character, storytelling, language, all that fun stuff. And then, of course, Coffee with Kenobi and all the wonderful things that that has done in my life. And I just keep coming back to it. In fact, uh, after Thanksgiving, we're, we're diving headlong uh, the rest of the semester into Star Wars. We're going to do a little bit of We've already done A New Hope. We're going to do a little bit of The Mandalorian. We're going to explore some of the prequels. Who knows where it's going to go? Who knows how I'll incorporate the book of Boba Fett? But one thing I know is that this mythology has created so many magical memories, moments, and friendships like we've been talking about. Because I'm a teacher, because I like Star Wars, and because of the show, I was invited to go to a few premieres, and most recently, The, the Rise of Skywalker, where I met a guy named Harrison Ford. And we talked about education. We talked about mythology. We talked about storytelling. And it was magical. It was absolutely magical. That That is, you know, people say, what's the one thing that is your favorite thing that you've ever gotten to do because of the show? Well, it's meeting Harrison Ford. Uh, because he is a storyteller through the lens of George Lucas. He's, George Lucas created so many wonderful characters. Harrison Ford is personified two pretty significant right. ones, Han Solo and Indiana Jones. And I am forever thankful for that. Well, we have a lot to be thankful for. And uh, as we both said, our fellow fans are among the things that we are most thankful for. And being able to mm -hmm. share this wonderful mythology that George Lucas created and that continues today, multi-generational, many points of entry, um it's just it's just a wonderful thing that has enriched my life and changed my life in so many dramatic ways here here uh as we as we wrap up the show i want to thank you of course for sharing uh, your amazing memories and stories i mean i wish you had a weekly podcast because i could listen to hear you talk about your stories forever my friend uh you did pop up pretty recently on disney plus Speaking of Boba Fett, Boba Fett under the hood, uh, talk to us uh, kind of about that. That was that was so cool to see you on that, and of, and of course you should be on there. That just I really had a lot of fun. That you must have had a ball filming that as well. It was great. Um, it was uh, something that was done fairly recently. I think they came up with the idea fairly recently and uh, pulled it all together in just like two or three months. And uh, the crew was here for about three or four hours, and there was an off-camera host who was uh, uh, asking me a lot of questions, and then we did the walkthrough of the museum. But it was a lot of fun putting together. I've done a lot of uh, video, uh, but um, this this was great, and it was uh, it was really fun to uh, to see myself pop up on the screen and. Uh, talk about one of my favorite characters and one of my favorite actors, Jeremy Bullock, the late Jeremy Bullock. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it was uh, it was a blast. And I, I texted you and I said, hey, one of my students just said, hey, did you see that Boba Fett special? Did you see that guy's collection? That was so cool. And I said, not only did I see it, I've seen it in person. And that guy's my friend. Well, Steve, you gave me a lot of street <laughs> credit, my friend, for that one. <laughs> great listening to coffee with kenobi you are with dan z the podcast you're looking for this is <laughs> as we near the end of the show today i want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our star wars family we've got here at coffee with kenobi be sure to tune in Monday nights. I'm on Facebook Live 
at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee, tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun, and you'll make some new friends, as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pourover, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, feel free to email me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zare, M-R-Z-E-H-R, or on Instagram at CWK. There are also a lot more ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi. Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanzyMedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks as always to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word. And I can't thank you enough for your help, for your support, and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. Fabulous. Well, uh, we've talked about Rancho Obi-Wan. Please, as we wrap up, let everybody know where they can find out more about Rancho Obi-Wan, where they can be a member, and where they can chat with you on social media. So uh, RanchoObiWan.org is the place to go. You can become a member of our virtual museum through November 29th. You can catch up on our virtual gala this year and see all kinds of other video clips. Um, uh, for a mere $10 contribution, you can become a member of Rancho Obi-Wan. You get an annual membership kit. We have a special, again, through uh, the end of November, a special catch up. If you missed out on any of the last 10 years, we you can uh, register at a reduced price and get the patch and membership kit 
from the years that you missed or do an entire wrap up for the 10 years. We've had a lot of people do that. So uh, it's been good. These have been tough times, obviously, for a lot of small businesses and nonprofits. And uh, we appreciate all the help that we've been getting. Absolutely. Well, be sure to to sign up for that, to check out the virtual goodness of the Rancho Obi-Wan Galley. You've got till November 29th. Do not miss out. You're going. It's going to a great cause and you get an incredible amount from it as we get an incredible amount of joy and gratefulness for having you on the show. Steve, thanks so much. Happy Thanksgiving. I look forward to seeing you in the future. Same here, Dan. And thank you very much for the invitation. A huge, huge thank you to Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan for joining us on Thanksgiving. I am thankful for each and every one of you, for your friendship, for your listening to the show, for your spreading the word about Coffee with Kenobi, both here on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and even TikTok. I actually added TikTok recently. I think I've talked about that before. I am thankful for all of you. Please have a wonderful rest of your Thanksgiving holiday holiday weekend and we transition into the Christmas holiday season. There will be lots more from Coffee with Kenobi, including some topics that I'm very excited to share with you. And next week, by the way, speaking of excited to share with you, is the debut of my second Star Wars book, the Star Wars Character Encyclopedia Updated and Expanded Edition. Lots more to come as we talk about the creation of that book. Enjoy your weekend and turkey. And remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 